Okay, so here we are. Um, you yeah, guys have a nice morning. I'm sure you were diligently looking at your research methods uh, materials, correct? At least I, there's some honesty. Okay, that's fine. So everyone got a nice, nice morning to sleep in. I don't get those anymore, but that's okay. okay it's, it's just made worse now by having once they start multiplying. But anywho, um, so. Any questions about anything we covered, previous sections, neurology? Have time for your brain to simmer on that a little bit. Hopefully it didn't induce any seizures. I hope not, anywho. Uh, I found my new favorite joke for the day. If you guys would like to hear it, to warm us up to the topic today. Uh, do you guys know who led the Israelites through a semi-permeable membrane? Osmosis. <laughs> that was pretty good. I didn't come up with it. I just saw it online. So anyway, that's a very good joke. Anywho, so we're talking ob gyn So you've covered most of the gyn stuff already, correct? Have you started OB yet? Okay, good. So we're going to cover uh, drug use and, and drug concerns uh, during pregnancy first and then we'll talk a little bit about as we're going to get into more of the guidance section we'll talk more about hormones and all that fun stuff again my disclaimer is i am no expert on uh, women i can barely know how to talk to them including my wife it is still amazing to me that i uh, have been married as long as i have been lord knows i put my foot in my mouth more than on a few occasions usually when she's pregnant i don't know why i just tend to do it more often than it's not it's not a good idea it's more dangerous for me if anything so anyhow Okay, so pregnancy and lactation. So why is why is drug use potentially bad for pregnant women and people lactating? The baby, right? The baby's a concern, right? You worry about drug transfer over to the either the fetus who's in development or uh, in lactation standpoint over to uh, the nursing uh, infant here. So a little bit of history. Um, so there are laws set up now uh, around. You know the drugs that can be administered, uh, especially like you know studies and things like that. But a lot about the the you know the pregnancy risk and things that we've discovered. A lot of those laws are designed uh, around some of these tragedies that have occurred here in the past. So um, the reason why you have safety packaging on a lot of drugs, like tamper evident packaging, is because people have gone through and they've tampered with drugs, and that caused a lot of people to die in the past. And these are decades and decades ago. But the reason why these laws exist is because someone kind of abused the system, or have discovered things like this. Uh, has anyone heard of the drug thalidomide? Right, so um, thalidomide is a drug, fortunately, did not get a lot of use here in the U.S. We actually still use it very, very rarely for certain cancer indications, but uh, it was a drug that originally was marketed, uh, especially like in the U.K. and different parts of Europe, as being a good, like, anxiolytic slash, um, you know, they're using it for nausea and uh, pregnancy-related nausea and vomiting. And they realized the children were coming out, they're having these limb malformations, so they basically had these, like, kind of flipper-like appendages uh, they just didn't develop correctly in utero. And so they saw that. And fortunately, we didn't have a whole lot of use here in the U.S., as I mentioned. Uh, and so we didn't really have a whole lot of babies that were exposed to this. But it kind of goes to show you that, like, wow, we didn't even really know what the potential risks were. And so now we have certain safety things in place to make sure that, uh, you know, tragedies like this do not happen and, and, and fetuses are not uh, being unnecessarily exposed to potential teratogens, which is, again, that term we'll use as being something that is potentially dangerous to, to a developing fetus. And so um, this is where we have the Kefauver Harris drug amendment. Um, uh, probably mentioned it before. We have the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. That's the main um, set of laws that the FDA follows when they're trying to regulate things like the, the cosmetics you can sell, or the drugs you use, and food, and, and things like that. So, anywho. So uh, this is also very important because we're starting to see more and more use of medications during pregnancy. Um, you know, obviously the the big mantra is if we can like hold off on drug use during pregnancy, that's going to be the best thing for most uh, developing fetuses. So again, let fewer drugs are going to be better, but there are going to be occasions where you have to treat, and so it's important that we know which drugs are going to be most. Um, uh, most safe for those uh, effective for mom and safe for the the fetus and so again just kind of showing you this a little bit older data but you can kind of see how the trends are going up where you know you can see this blue line here you know percent of women taking four or more medications at any time during pregnancy uh, which seems like a lot right so of course they include things like tylenol and kind of more um more benign over-the-counter drugs like you might think but we'll see some of those over-the-counter drugs can actually be pretty dangerous in and of themselves but anywho, so again, risks are going up. Uh, the more drug exposure you have, the worse off it's going to be. Also, you have a lot of, uh, especially if you work in a NICU or kind of tangential to a NICU, you see a lot of um, kids who have had inter, uh, uterine drug exposure to like a lot of illicit substances. Um, has anyone heard of the term neonatal abstinence syndrome? Right, so what is that, you think, just based off the name? <laughs> 
yeah, baby goes through drug withdrawals, essentially. So the baby was exposed to drugs uh, that the mom was exposed to. So you have things like cocaine is a big one, uh, alcohol, um, you know, other CNS depressants, opioids are another big one. Uh, baby comes out, and that baby's been used, that fetus has been used to exposure to those drugs for several months now, possibly all nine months of gestation. And then when they come out, they're used to having that drug around. And then when they don't have it anymore, guess what? They, they get pretty cranky, just like a regular person would who's addicted to some of those medications. And so that's a, that's a big problem we run into with some of our NICU kiddos is they get very irritable and they're uh, just a little bit more difficult. Usually they're premature as well. So you'll, you'll find that a lot of uh, illicit drug exposure also leads to premature uh, births and low birth weights and, and things like that. Anywho, so it's important at least you're aware uh, which medications are out there, what's the safest treatments for, for these uh, these ladies. So anyway, so again, at least 90% of women take at least one medication during pregnancy, but it's probably going to be even more than that in a lot of cases. Um, as far as over-the-counter medications, acetaminophen is probably the most common one, and that'll be pretty evident because that's probably the one that has the most kind of safety evidence behind it. But even things like ibuprofen can be problematic. Um, we'll see that the pregnancy category for certain drugs can actually change based on the stage of development of the fetus. And so some things are really dangerous, uh, especially during the first trimester, and some things are more dangerous during the uh, later stages of pregnancy, as we'll see. And we'll talk about why that is a little bit later. Um, and also things like antidepressants are starting to be uh, more and more commonly used. Why do, why do you think that is? What do we use antidepressants in a mom for? Yeah, a lot of us postpartum depression. Uh, some uh, women develop, you know, depression, and, and some of them were depressant, uh, depressed, depressed beforehand, uh, and then they become pregnant. Guess what? Now they have all this extra stress, and they have a lot of anxiety. That could also be another reason why they need to continue treatment. We'll look at some of that and some of the risks associated with it later on. The other thing is just more uh, more awareness and kind of a more... Um, you know, uh, just you can have more frank conversations with people. They're more likely to bring it up because, you know, a lot of women uh, may not want to take any medications during their pregnancy. They said, nope, I don't want to have any risk whatsoever. I'm just going to hold off and I'm going to tough it out. And that may not be best for for every mom. So, again, that's one of those things where you need to have those kind of conversations and, and say it's not a sign of weakness. Like you, you have a medical condition just like anyone else. You may need treatment to, you know, throughout this pregnancy. So we'll look at that a little bit later as well. Okay, so our definitions we'll look at, uh, teratogenesis is going to be, you know, any kind of significant postnatal change we're going to find, either function or form uh, of the offspring. And then uh, congenital anomalies are going to be those, um, you know, that includes those congenital malformations and defects are related to that change in function. It's kind of a more specific term there. And then those uh, malformations where we actually have the, um, you know, things that are interfering with the actual, the, the, the viability or the physical well-being. We will refer to the drugs as teratogens. They uh, cause teratogenesis. So that's kind of a general term for the drugs themselves. So you could say ter uh, thalidomide is a teratogen, essentially. And that's kind of the most common terminology we'll use. So some known uh, teratogens, and again, this is not an all-inclusive list, but these are some of the really high-profile ones you think about. Um, you have things like ACE inhibitors. Like you never ever use an ACE inhibitor on a uh, potentially pre uh, pregnant woman uh, because we know there's significant uh, changes that happen, especially with things like angiogenesis uh, within the, the growing fetus. So that's a category X. Um, androgenic hormones, in general, hormones are no good uh, during pregnancy because uh, you have a developing fetus. They require hormones for development of a lot of structures and things. Um, cigarette smoking. Obviously, no good. Cocaine, um, warfarin is another big one. So again, we'll see that this can be problematic because uh, you guys cover, you know, kind of what happens to the coagulability of pregnant females. They become hypercoagulable. So it's one of those things where if they have a clot or they need warfarin, like, well, what can we use instead? So we'll look at some ways to get around that just a little bit later. Um, isotretinoin, we mentioned that REMS program that we use uh, back when we were talking about treatment of acne. And so that's one of those things where because of that known risk for teratogenesis is so uh, significant to the fetus, they have to do things like have regular pregnancy tests to make sure the, uh, that either – you know, the female's not becoming pregnant. Even male patients have to sign up with this to make sure they're using protection and things like that um, because, again, the risk is, is so big. Uh, we'll talk about lithium a little bit later in the behavioral section after this. And then a couple more, like valproic acid. As I mentioned, neural tube defects are a big one um, that's been linked back with valproic acid, and even phenytoin can do this as well. So, again, that question comes up, well, how do you best treat a patient as a seizure disorder? Because, um, again, you know, it's one of those things where and we run into this in talks in, in some cases because, as you might imagine, um, someone has a surprise pregnancy. Um, they may lead them to be quite distraught, and so we've had some cases where people are trying to inflict their own harm uh, when they find out they become pregnant. So the question is, well, some of the antidotes we could give them could be potentially teratogenic, but ultimately if the mom succumbs to the, you know, the drug exposure, guess what? Fetus isn't going to make it either. So it's one of those things where it's going to have to make kind of a cost benefit, or not cost benefit, but a risk benefit sort of analysis. So where do we find out how 
drugs are teratogenic or not? How do we find this information out? So can I do randomized control trials? Generally not a good idea. Um, probably wouldn't find too many people to actually sign up for that voluntarily. Uh, and also just super not ethical to say, I'm gonna give you this drug to see what kind of what happens to your baby. And you get no drug, we'll see what happens to your baby. Then no one's gonna do that, right? So we have to rely on more kind of anecdotal sort of uh, information. So you have things like case reports that will come out that will give us just single individuals uh, who have had an exposure, their baby comes out and then they had this, this condition that pops up, right? So whatever it happens to be. Um, can you draw any sort of causality from that sort of information? No, right? So you can see, you know, again, this is just an end of one when you're doing the case report, or maybe a couple of cases, but generally you're gonna find that's not super useful. Um, but it is good to at least note it. Okay, so this happened, maybe if we see it happen again and again, as more people are exposed, that may gives us some kind of clue here. So that's where you can use case control studies, where again, we're not, um, we're looking at people who've had the outcome Right, we're looking at um, people who've had a, a negative, you know, fetal outcome, and then looking back to see what kind of drug exposures they had, or what type of other, type, you know, environmental exposures potentially. That could be one way that helps us to strengthen the uh, the case there, but again, does not actually prove causality in a lot of those instances. Core studies can be used occasionally, and then a lot of times you're going to find uh, voluntary reporting systems can be used. So they'll set up certain ones for different drugs, where even though it's like a drug may be a known teratogen, the problem is when some women become pregnant, when did they find out about it? Could be weeks, could be months in some cases. I've heard rare cases where people go nine months and they're like, man, I, my stomach's really bothering me. I should go to the ER. And it's like, oh, you're pregnant and here's the baby. <laughs> Not super common, but it can happen, right? Um, so people may be exposed to drugs. They don't even realize that they're pregnant in the first place. So that can be important information as well. So say, okay, we had you know a month or two where you're on this drug that is a potential teratogen. Um, let's follow that infant to see kind of what happens. So that can be very useful. Um, in some cases, they'll use animal studies, and this is usually in the preclinical sort of setting uh, when they're trying to determine safety and efficacy and things like that in the animal setting before they actually get approved for those kind of phase one trials and actually test it in, in people. Um, now, is can we perfectly extrapolate information from animals to humans? No, it's not perfect. Uh, There's some uh, extrapolations you can make, but again, mice are not people, monkeys are not people. Uh, there's some commonalities, but again, every animal is gonna be a little different. But it could be one of those things where if we see that, yes, this drug is really super teratogenic in mice, it might not be even worth it to you know, try to you know have exposure in a human just because it is you know so clear of an indicator there. So again, um, what you find is that it'll kind of have a standard uh, disclaimer when regarding drug exposure to uh, pregnant females. And they basically say, you know, we don't really have an established safe uh, uh, limit to exposure for these drugs. Um, again, the studies, there's no randomized controlled studies where you can really draw, you know, true causality there. Um, so you have to look at the risk versus benefits and kind of weigh your options and decide whether or not it's really important enough to treat. And so we'll look at some of uh, the pregnancy categories and how those come about from the sort of information uh, moving forward. So anywho, so looking at stages of fetal development, um, we'll talk more about uh, infant development uh, in the PEDS section later on in this class, but this is just strictly for looking at the fetus itself. Um, again, uh, the most important time in general for most drug exposure is gonna be during this first trimester, during this organogenesis period. Um, this is where having, again, the beginnings of all the organs start to form. This is where drug exposure can have major, major influences on that fetus. So again, like things like valproic acid, and affect the neural tube uh, quite significantly. You have microcephaly, uh, all kinds of different problems that can uh, develop from that. Um, and then afterwards, you know, you're getting this uh, further development. Um, again, you're going to see less uh, pronounced effect due to drug exposure during this time period, but there'll be some notable exceptions to that. So, like when I talk about NSAIDs a little bit later in the third trimester, that'll become uh, more apparent. Get it become apparent? Yeah. Anywho. Um, so, as I mentioned, NSAIDs in the stage of pregnancy is important. So, I kind of alluded to this previously, but uh, I mentioned that in the in cases of, of a fetus, you know, uh, we've got like fetal blood flow at all. It's very different from people, as you'll as you'll learn once you get to that. Uh, I guess probably when. Dr. Nicholson covers peas, I might imagine she'll cover that. But um, basically, they require certain uh, uh, you know, structures to be open or closed in order to make sure that the blood flow is uh, going appropriately, because again, they're being given oxygen and, and nutrients you know, via the umbilical cord. So one of the things you see is they need this uh, ductus arteriosus to maintain that blood flow between the venous and the arterial side. And actually, that is kept open by prostaglandins. Um, and so in these cases, if you have a patient who comes out, 
or they were uh, you know, in the fetal stages, and you close that prematurely by giving something that blocks prostaglandin synthesis. You can close that early and cause issues for the, the fetus. So this is where you might actually see the uh, pregnancy category change based on the trimester. So something like uh, you know ibuprofen, maybe like a C during, say, the first and second trimester. During uh, the third trimester, becomes like a D. And we'll talk about what those letters mean just a little bit later. But D sounds worse than C, right? Like I'd rather make a C on a test than a D, probably. These don't really make Ds anymore, but uh, sounds worse. <laughs> The right of administration can be really important as well. So, um, for instance, uh, if I have a systemic exposure, um, you know, if I take something orally or intravenously, um, that may influence how it's going to have exposure to the fetus versus if I were to use something much more locally. So if I just use like a, dermal, a, a topical product uh, to only treat like, say, a local area or something like an intravaginal product that will only kind of affect local tissues, um, that can be uh, a way of limiting systemic exposure and potential exposure to the fetus. So that can be uh, very important there as well. And then obviously dose duration, you know, uh, someone who's been exposed to, say, alcohol for only, say, the first few weeks of pregnancy, because uh, maybe mom was on their honeymoon and she didn't realize that she was pregnant, um, as happened to my sister, when she had her first one, just kind of, they go to sandals, come back, and all of a sudden, oh, we're pregnant, crazy. <laughs> But she, she wasn't aware of that, but certainly I can imagine she was exposed to some alcohol. Uh, her baby came out, no problems, right? Versus if you were to have uh, alcohol exposure the entire uh, nine months, that's going to have a much uh, bigger effect there. So again, dose duration all, are all going to be important considerations there. Um, so and the effects can go anywhere from you know, complete destruction of the fetus, um, structural anomalies, you know, growth retardation, all these different things can happen. Uh, and it runs a, a very wide gamut there. And again, some of these things, you might not even uh, have an idea of what the actual changes are uh, for potential decades. Some of these things may not pop up. And the other thing we run into with a lot of things, especially with like antidepressant exposure in fetuses, um, we don't have studies that go on for 30, 40, 50 years to determine how these kids do as they become adults later on in life. So again, a lot of information is just not really known at this time. So how do drugs cross over and get into, uh, cross the placenta and actually expose to the fetus? And what kind of dictates what drugs are going to cross over? Because some drugs we can give to females uh, and they will have no, no transfer over whatsoever. A lot of it goes back to the physiochemical properties of that drug itself. So look, same things we'll look at. So lipid solubility. Do you think more lipid solubility makes it easier to cross the placenta or harder? makes it easier, right? So then things are more lipid, they can cross those biological membranes much more easily. Uh, so things that are more lipid soluble tend to cross easier over into the placenta and then uh, to expose, uh, get exposed to the fetus. Uh, charge is also important here as well. So uh, you guys remember that term I kind of talked about, it's ion trapping, remember what that is? Basically, you can have a change of pH and that will change the charge on the molecule to make it where it can get over and across the membrane, but then it can't get back out. So in tip, uh, typically, you'll find that the fetal pH is a little bit lower than the maternal pH. You know, mom may be sitting like a 7.4. It's a little bit lower for the fetus. As that drug crosses over and it gets into a more acidic medium, like a weak acid or something, more of it becomes in a charged state and it can have a harder time getting back across. That can increase the exposure that the fetus would have to that drug in that case. We'll talk about this again when we get to the um, uh, transfer over to breast milk and the same uh, properties are going to uh, carry over there as well. So just keep that in mind. And then looking at the molecular weight, um, you know, things that are smaller tend to have an easier time crossing than very, very large molecules. So again, it's going to the same general rule. These are very similar to when we talked about um, transfer uh, across the skin as well. Remember, we said things are more lipid soluble, cross easier, larger molecules have a harder time, you know, things like that. And then protein binding can be important here as well. Um, this is important in so far as how tightly mom's albumin and different proteins bind to drugs that may help to prevent some exposure to the fetus. Or in some cases, you actually find that fetal hemoglobin and different fetal proteins can actually hold on to certain substances uh, more tightly uh, than, than the mom can. So a good ex uh, example of this would be carbon monoxide. You know where you find carbon monoxide, it's not a drug, but you know where you find carbon monoxide? Generators. Yeah, generators can be a big one, cars. Yeah, so uh, it's a uh, byproduct of, of combustion. And so it's one of those things where um, fetal hemoglobin actually binds much more tightly to carbon monoxide than regular hemoglobin does. And guess who has a lot of fetal hemoglobin? Fetuses. So when the mom gets exposed, even though she may not have a, a very significant exposure, it may be much more deleterious for the fetus because they bind onto it so, so much more tightly and they hold onto it for longer. So just an example of, of how that, that protein binding can be an important uh, feature there. So looking at uh, 
you know, and again, uh, just like people have our liver to try to metabolize a lot of things, a lot of toxins before they get into the system, the, uh, the placenta can do this as well and, and help with the fetal metabolism. Um, so the two main things you're going to find to help to um, protect the fetus is going to be this kind of placental function. So again, it's a kind of a semi-permeable membrane that prevents certain things from crossing over. Um, there's also going to be some limited drug metabolism. There will be enzymes there that can actually start metabolize certain drugs, uh, which is one means of, of protection. Um, and then you're going to find that uh, as far as blood flow through the fetus to the umbilical vein, there's a lot of that blood flow that ends up going to the liver first, because again, it's more like... Uh, kind of going on to the fetus's venal, uh, venous, I should say. Um, they get, a lot of that goes to the liver. And even though the liver of the fetus is not super developed uh, as compared to a person, you know, a human, or I guess an adult, I should say. They're all human, right? Um, at least I think most of them are human. But they should, you know, not as compared to an adult, uh, they will not have the same kind of capacity to metabolize a lot of things. So again, just going to show you why exposure is so much more important to those fetuses, because again, they may not be able to really protect themselves from it uh, to the same extent that an adult might. So we have pregnancy categories. These are kind of going by the wayside, as we'll see. They're not super useful. Have I covered these explicitly before? I remember, briefly? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so here's uh, kind of the, the full story on the pregnancy categories. I'm sure you've uh, at least heard of them, if not from me, then uh, from, from other sources. But um, we have A, B, C, D, and X. So someone failed kindergarten, probably, and didn't learn their ABCs appropriately. But that's uh, the categories they, they have for a while. And so A tends to be the safest medications that we can administer. So these are things that we have controlled studies in women. And again, some of these studies might be dating back decades, back when um, maybe the, the ethics behind studies were not quite so tight as they are nowadays. But um, they may have, uh, we have good uh, evidence that exposure to uh, these drugs causes no harm to the fetus. Um, and so these are going to be things. Can you think of any examples like a, a category A substance? Tylenol probably is going to be more like a B. We'll talk about why that is in just a little bit. But A are going to be things like think about like vitamins, like vitamin B6. Like your body naturally has that anyway. Like it's probably not going to cause any fetal harm. Like right? so, think about things like that. Um, category B is going to be not quite as uh, tight from a, a safety perspective, but typically they're going to have animal studies that don't indicate risk to the fetus. Uh, and maybe there have been no, uh, you know, controlled studies in, in women, because again, these studies are hard to come by in a lot of cases. A lot of times we're just looking kind of retrospective uh, exposure data. Or if they have animal studies that do indicate risk, because again, the animals not one to one to humans, um, you're going to find that the, they have human studies that actually fail to demonstrate any risk. So this is or definitely something like a Tylenol might come up uh, much more likely. Yes, ma'am. You will find that a lot of them will not delineate and just be kind of a, a trans pregnancy sort of category. So it covers all, all the trimesters. Um, but there will be specific examples where it will change and it will mention that, right? So ibuprofen I, oh, and NSAIDs always mentions kind of the, the exception to the rule. But most of these are referring to, if you see like a C or an A, typically is referring to the entire pregnancy. But it will be explicit when you're looking up on like a drug reference. So if you look up on Lexicomp or wherever you're looking, it will tell you specifically if there's any changes that occur. Is there another question? Okay. Um, so anyway, so B are still pretty safe for the most part. Um, and again, if I had to think about it, I always think back about, about to, you know, would I give my wife, uh, who was just recently pregnant, would I give her this medication? And A, I would definitely say, yep, you can receive this, no problem. A B, I would feel very safe uh, about her receiving as well. I would not worry about the, the well-being of, of my child, right? So again, if you can think back, kind of make it into those terms, make it a little bit more personal, you know, kind of gives you some ideas. Okay, yeah, these are pretty safe drugs for the most part. Again, you try to hold exposure if possible, but in those cases you do need to treat, these are probably going to be okay. Now, you get into the less favorable categories. So I'll go over D and X first and go back to C, because uh, C is kind of like the, um, you know that drawer you have like in your kitchen where you just kind of throw like all kinds of like instruction <laughs> manuals and like old electronics and stuff like that? C it kind of is that junk drawer. Um, so I'll cover D and X first. So D is going to be something where we actually have positive evidence that uh, there is harm to the fetus. We know there's going to be harm to the fetus, but there may be some circumstances where the risk of treat, or, you know, the risk of damage to the fetus is outweighed by the potential benefits to the mom. These are not given very often, and in fact, you should uh, be very hesitant to give D medications to a pregnant woman, but it could be one of those uh, situations where uh, demise of the mom means demise of the fetus. So again, if you have to, you know, kind of go back to that risk-benefit analysis, um, you want to try to keep the mom alive if possible. So um, I believe that like warfarin falls under a D category uh, as one of those things where like, you know, if they're having an active embolism, like that's not great, right? So um, but I'll talk about different drugs you can use that, but typically avoid Ds. 
just know there may be a, a situation where it could uh, the benefits may outweigh the risk. Um, how ethical is that as far as like giving, like giving the mom priority over the fetus? Like, does is it talked about with that? I'm yeah, it has to be it has to be a conversation with the with the patient, obviously. And again, we as time goes on, we develop better therapies for things, and we can avoid a lot of that. So, like we talk about hypercoagulability a little bit. Like we you never use warfarin, right? Even though it historically might have like a D category, you you never use it because we have better things to treat nowadays. But like I go uh, talk about like in the um, uh, from the talk standpoint, um, you know, if I have a young lady, uh, you know, I've seen this a few times where you have a young lady, she finds out she's pregnant. Uh, on accident and she has a bunch of prenatal vitamins available to her has a ton of iron in it all of a sudden you have an iron overdose and that's a very potentially dangerous sort of overdose definitely life-threatening it's one of those things where like okay we have an antidote we don't really know what the actual risks are because again it's not a drug we give very often unless you have someone who's overdosed on iron and that small subset of those who've overdosed on iron also are pregnant you usually don't have that information so it's one of those things where like well the mom's gonna die if we don't give her this and if she dies the fetus is definitely gonna die or there's some potential risk to the fetus that we don't know about that one you kind of go with, with treating the mom you know so again it's one of those uh, it's a tough decision usually some, when you have a conversation with but again someone who's like actually inducing self-harm like a, a lot of times they don't have really a choice in, in the treatment you know, when it comes to that standpoint you know so we're going to try to save you as best we can and we'll figure it out later right anyway so um category exo they are, have no potential benefit these are absolutely contraindicated because of the known uh, fetal risk there's no situations in which um the mom may uh, receive benefits that outweigh that risk to the fetus so think about um accutane or isotretinoin this is a big one where it's like guess what mom has uh, uh acne she gets pregnant you might have to go with some acne for a while sorry tough luck but uh, your fetus is going to thank you later, uh, unless she's a teenager, and then she'll probably say, I hate you, mom, but that's for different reasons. <laughs> that's my biggest fear if my kids are going to like grow to just be like, I hate you, dad. Um, <laughs> my toddler already kind of does that a little bit. Like when she sees me come to the house, she like runs away and that's <laughs> whatever. Anywho, um, I just pay the bills, whatever. It's not like putting clothes on her back and food on the table, whatever. You can run away. <laughs> I'm not better. Um, anywho, so category C, though, as I mentioned, is kind of the junk drawers. That's kind of everything where we're not really sure. Again, there's not good evidence. There may be some evidence um, in some animal studies that indicate risk, but we just don't have a good human data to really say whether or not. So this is one of those things where it's kind of a shoulder shrug, like, I don't know if it's safe or not. I would feel more hesitant about giving a drug like this to my uh, you know, pregnant wife or a pregnant uh, family member just because, again, it's just so unknown. So these are not super useful. Something is an A or B, great. But how many drugs do you think automatically get added or you know, on an ongoing basis get added to the A or B category? Not many, right? It's very difficult to get because, again, the, the, the exposures, you're trying to limit that wherever you can. So we don't have a ton of data that comes out for this kind of this niche uh, kind of population. So these categories are not super useful. They're kind of going by the wayside. But you will see that a lot of these drugs already have categories associated with them. They'll still be present in a lot of those drug references that are out there. So um, we'll go back to that. We'll talk about the new categories a little bit later. I don't know why I didn't put those slides there now, but we'll come back. Um, so anyway, so talking about transfer to the breast milk, because again, pregnancy and lactation usually get covered in the same section in a drug reference. Um, but you worry about also exposure to the infant after they have been born and they're now being exposed to breast milk from the mom. Um, so very similar characteristics to placental transfer. So you're looking at things like lipid solubility. Um, and in fact, actually the, the stage of the milk might actually um, have a role in just how much transfer occurs. So if you have like this hind milk is coming, um, it has a higher lipid content that would make it easier for certain drugs to cross over and, uh, and be soluble there. Charge, as I mentioned, breast milk tends to be a little bit more acidic um, than the normal serum, uh, the normal plasma. So that, again, that can lead to trapping of weak acids and things like that. And as I mentioned, the molecular size smaller is easier to transfer and then less protein binding, more transfer you can have there. But of course, sometimes in the in the um, in the actual breast milk, you can actually have uh, proteins there that may bind up the drugs, and that will cause kind of a trapping effect, similar to what we see the ion trapping as well. So. Um, Looking at the time since delivery can also play a role here. So when you're looking at kind of um, the early time frame, so the early couple of weeks after birth, you actually find there's larger gaps in these mammary alveolar cells uh, where you can have better transfer. So they, it's not as uh, of a protected kind of membrane as it would be a few weeks later as they start to close up, maybe about two weeks or so postpartum. Um, so that can be a big thing there. Um, and then the other big thing is going to be this uh, maternal serum concentration. So just like we said, you know, bigger concentrations on the outside of the skin lead to better trans uh, metal through the skin same thing happens here so the higher the drug concentration is in the plasma for the mom the more transfer you're going to have over to the breast milk which could be exposed to the feet or the uh, the infant at that point 
So this is where you can do things like strategic um, scheduled feedings, where you can maybe have uh, the infant will uh, feed off of mom, uh, now they're nice and uh, full, then you can go ahead and have the mom be exposed to whatever substance, and then by the time the next feeding comes along, especially if she's like pumping and things like that, um, you have like kind of a uh, supply stored up, um, then you may be able to have exposure to that medication, and then by the time the mom's ready to feed again, feed the baby again, and then the concentrations have dipped low enough where the uh, exposure is pretty negligible. Um, so I always equate this back to alcohol. Think about that, you know, moms, uh, you know, they've had nine months where they're not allowed to drink at all, and so they may want a glass of wine every once in a while. Who knows? So uh, you can try to time things out like that where you have the feeding. Mom has a glass of wine. And then, you know, by the time the next feeding comes around, the alcohol has been metabolized off and really little to no fetal exposure happens there. Um, have you ever seen any of uh, those little test kits they actually have where you can actually uh, dip it in uh, to the breast milk to see if there's any alcohol present? So you can have kits like that available. You probably don't need it if you can do this kind of strategic uh, sort of feeding anyway. Of course, if there is a little bit of alcohol in the breast milk and they sleep a little better, I'm not going to fight you on it. Like, whatever. <laughs> anyway, as we see, you know, breast milk uh, tends to be a little bit more acidic. Um, just depends on on the mom. Depends on lots of things, uh, lots of features there. Okay, so the changes uh, that have occurred more recently in the past couple of years uh, in regarding to the labeling of uh, a lot of new medications and things like that. Now, as I mentioned, really limited utility with the kind of the old nomenclature, that ABCDX categorization. So nowadays, um, we talk about updates in these reproductive risks. So not only are they now talking about things like um, uh, the actual, you know, the uh, pregnancy itself, but now they're going to start to include things like uh, labor and delivery risks. They'll start to uh, include things about contraception in there. And so, um, again, that's where you kind of have this female and male reproductive potential, right? So, like I mentioned with Accutane, even though guys don't get pregnant, they can still potentially have drug exposure that may be uh, affecting the fetus, right, uh, of the mom who may become pregnant. So those risks are also going to be included in there as well. And so this is going to be in a lot of uh, new packaging that comes out. A lot of drug references will be referring to it as this. So you can see kind of what's happening in pregnancy, of the lactation section, and then finally that reproductive potential section as well. So it's kind of the newer kind of labeling that we'll see uh, going forward. So just some examples I put on here. So here's an example of warfarin. You can see here uh, it has the old nomenclature presence, so that uh, pregnancy risk factor D. So it says, okay, women, mechanical heart valves, um, you know, possibly other indications, but this would be the main situation in which, you know, mechanical heart valves are known to clot off. They tend to be very hypercoagulable. You know, this is where a case where potentially benefit to the mom might uh, outweigh the, the risk of the fetus. So that's the old nomenclature. Not a ton of information. However, you can have this new sections that come about called pregnancy considerations. And what this will do is actually go through the evidence and go through the case series and the cohort studies and whatever they have available to say, okay, here's what happened to these women who had exposures. And this is nice because you can have a better conversation with um, you know, a potential uh, patient who might be exposed to this. You can say, okay, listen, you know, here are the risks uh, that are present. Here are the type of women that were exposed to it. Here's what I think you know are your risk, and, and you have a better conversation about weighing the, the risks and the benefits. That's one example uh, of warfarin. There you see all the breast feeding considerations. Um, they'll actually give you guideline recommendations as well if those are out there, either from uh, ACOG or any other um, or, or organizations that are kind of um, uh, dealing with that. So that can be very useful. Another good example is on Dancitron or Zofran, because again, a lot of pregnant women get what? They get very nauseous and they vomit uh, occasionally. Uh, some more, uh, more than others, but on Dancitron might be one of those things where you may need to give that. So again, this has a pregnancy category of B. For a long time, though, Zofran, because it's a relatively new drug compared to a lot of the other antiemetics that we have available, as we'll learn in the GI section, um, that used to be a C for a long time. But again, there's so many women that got exposed to it, and we had evidence to say, well, we have these you know, thousands or, or millions of women who have been exposed to on Dancitron, and we've seen no evident risk to the fetus. Okay, let's reclassify that as a B. So I was one that actually uh, changed over time. But, um, you know, if you're even dealing with something that's a C category, you can at least see the pregnancy considerations and say, okay, or here are the women who have been exposed to it. Here's what happened to their fetuses. Um, you kind of make your best judgment based on that and, and the conversation you have with the, the mom at that point. That kind of makes sense? So you can make sure, uh, even though it's a little bit more reading on your part, it's nice just to look at a letter and just be like, it's a B, it's good to go. Um, sometimes it's good to look through that because, again, they may have questions like, okay, well, it's a B, but then – why is it not an A? Are there risks out there that make it not an A? We can at least read that up and see if there's anything that's kind of potentially concerning to you. 
Okay, so some other changes that occur to the actual mom, so kind of focusing uh, away from the fetus and back onto mom herself, um, we see that a lot of these kind of physio physiologic changes that occur tend to occur in the first trimester, kind of peak around the second trimester. You see things like blood volume goes up pretty significantly, so around 30 to 40 percent or so, because again, you're pumping blood for two at that point. Um, you start to see things like renal blood flow goes up and GFR tends to go pretty significantly as well, because again, more waste products you're producing, you need to get rid of, and then cardiac output can go up uh, pretty drastically as well. So again, we'll see also um, pregnant see really hypertension is going to be uh, one of the things we'll talk about here as well because we know that's going to be something that tends to increase um, as pregnancy comes along not only the blood volume but just the fact they're having to pump so much harder to get all that blood around so in some cases you may see the heart rate uh, uh, go up uh, but ideally you're going to see that most healthy relatively young women uh, are going to have their blood pressure really not change a ton because again uh, due to uh, you know the the elasticity of the vessels and they can you know relax vasodilate and relax and all that um, BP should remain relatively constant but for some women especially as you get uh, women of advanced maternal age and may already have things like pre-existing hypertension um, this may be exacerbated by that so just keep that in mind we'll talk about pregnancy related hypertension a little bit later on Okay, um, you can see things like GI motility goes down, which could be problematic, especially with a lot of the nausea and vomiting that goes along with that, may help exacerbate that. Uh, they tend to be in a hypercoagulable state, so clots are a potential risk uh, there as well. And then they actually have, um, going back to the kind of volume distribution and the pharmacokinetic concerns, you can see things like decreased albumin stores. So this means that if you have highly protein bound medications, they have less albumin to bind to, guess what? The volume distribution tends to go up because now they can kind of transfer out of the bloodstream and out to the tissues, right? So that can be a very very important clinical consideration for some drugs. And then uh, potentially with the weight gain, that can also affect uh, volume distribution because as they're building up some uh, more fat stores, uh, that can affect uh, fat soluble drugs and they may also have an increased volume distribution as well. So again, these are all things to kind of consider. And when you're looking at like dosing recommendations in pregnancy, this is where these changes are coming from, uh, keeping these things in mind. So um, as far as drug selection in pregnancy goes, as I mentioned, you like to avoid use wherever possible. Again, less exposure to the fetus is always going to be better uh, for the long run. Um, but you may need to think about acute uh, conditions that have come up during pregnancy. You may think about chronic conditions a mom maybe had before the pregnancy. You need to treat through that. So these are all considerations to make. So ideally, um, if you can try to identify medication use prior to conception, that's going to be beneficial. So if you have someone who's uh, trying to get pregnant, you can exp uh, kind of explore those drugs that they're taking uh, initially to see if they might have any negative effects, especially during that critical organogenesis phase. That's important to consider there. Uh, and eliminate any kind of non-essential medications, right? So, um, you know, if they're taking something like, um, I'm trying to think of something that would be non-essential. Uh, think about, so, so say they're being treated for hypertension, they're on, like say, like an ACE inhibitor. Well, that's going to be a medication that you probably need to treat their hypertension, but let's try to switch them off of something that would be less teratogenic. Right? So these are considerations you're making. Uh, and then discourage like self-medication. So you should have kind of a list of things that would be safe for them to take, but anything else they might want to take, even if they're over the counter, especially if it's herbals and things like that, they should probably talk to their provider, make sure that everything's on the, on the same page there. And so um, we'll also get minimizing exposure to some harmful medications. So again, looking at things like the dose that their patient's receiving, uh, the route of exposure, the dosage form, et cetera. So those all can be considerations as well. Right. So we'll talk about these conditions, um, some of the things that pop up uh, during pregnancy. So um, some of these uh, are, are endocrine conditions that we will talk about later in the endocrine section. Well, we'll talk about them in the case of pregnancy here, but um, some of the drugs may be new to you, but we will talk about them in later sections, but still kind of keep them in mind for for this section as far as testing goes. We'll talk about those as we get to them. But um, nausea and vomiting is going to be a big one. Um, you know, constipation, hemorrhoids can develop uh, from this. These are uh, common complaints you'll see with a lot of pregnant women. Um, and then things like just gestational diabetes, uh, gestational hypertension, and then coagulation disorders. So those are kind of the, the more um, potentially uh, dangerous ones, especially the hypertension and the hypercoagulability. Uh, we'll talk about those and how we can treat those uh, effectively uh, going forward. So looking at treatment of nausea and vomiting, uh, it's going to be pretty problematic because especially if you, uh, some of these women tend to lose, uh, they can lose a significant amount of weight secondary to the fact they're just so nauseous all the time. Um, my wife, especially, she had a lot of changes in what she, what kind of food she liked and what kind of food she was craving. And then also like her smells, uh, she had a very sensitive sniffer to begin with. Um, and, but you still have changes where things, certain things will just trigger her off. And she's like, oh my gosh, like the smell of I don't know, whatever I was cooking at that time, you used to think was fine. All of a sudden now it was not so fine. So it's like, okay, I'm not cooking this for nine months, whatever. No one trigger you off. But that can be something that can induce uh, nausea and vomiting. Uh, I've heard tale of some women who actually uh, have an aversion to their own husband's sense. Fortunately, that did not happen to me. Thank goodness. <laughs> 
Uh, I can be a little stinky sometimes, but fortunately, that was not one of her smells that triggered her off. Anywho, um, so things that they know certain food triggers, you know, uh, affect them. Dietary changes can be important, you know, maybe having smaller or frequent meals, things like that. But from a drug standpoint, um, you'll find that we have a couple of drugs that we can use that we consider category A drugs. And again, these are typically more safe to give to pregnant women. And so these are going to be our first line recommendations. So we actually recommend they can use a combination of pyridoxine, which is just vitamin B6. Again, I don't know the mechanism for why this helps with pregnancy-related nausea and vomiting. This is really the only condition you'll see where we use B6 for this, but they will use this in addition to doxalamine. Anyone remember where we saw doxalamine before? It's an over-the-counter drug. Sometimes used for sleep. Yeah, so units found in Unisom actually. So uh, anyone know what type of drug it is based off of that? It's an antihistamine, yeah. So it's a first generation antihistamine. So it's in the same vein as something like Benadryl, um, hydroxazine, those other kind of first generation antihistamines. And so uh, that makes sense because if I have anticholinergic activity, as we'll see in the GI section later on, that helps with um, reducing some of that effect, uh, reducing that nausea and vomiting associated uh, with uh, that, that pregnancy. So um, we use a combination doxalamine pyridoxine. You'll find that there is a combination product called Diclegis. Um, it's way more expensive than just buying the other two over the counter. So I actually just recommend just avoiding the diclegis as long as you're okay taking two pills instead of one. They can save a lot of money by just going and buy just any regular B6 they can find like at a Walmart, GNC, Publix, wherever, and buy some Unisom, combine those two, and that's great. The only thing you have to consider is that the Unisom is going to have what type of side effects? Yeah, so it's going to cause them to be drowsy, which could be good, especially if they're having trouble sleeping because they're so nauseous. Like, that could be a good thing for them. Um, but for some other people, they need to go to work and be productive. That may not be beneficial. So that is one thing, uh, one drawback to using the doxalamine from, from this combination. But otherwise, pyridoxine is very safe. Doxalamine is very safe from that standpoint. So those are ones that you can go with. Um, some of the other antiemetics that you can use occasionally are things like metoclopramide or Reglan uh, and promethazine. We will talk about these in the um, uh, behavioral section because these actually come up as uh, phenothiazines work very similar to a lot of other antipsychotics. Um, now, I would not uh, uh, you know, ever suggest that my wife was psychotic enough that she needed uh, promethazine, but maybe she's nauseous enough and I can give her some of that. Um, but again, these are, it's kind of a joke, but anyway. Um, <laughs> she's very good during pregnancy, she's fine. At least in my trial of two now, my end of two. Um, but uh, the other thing, those are very sedating as well. So especially promethazine can be very sedating, kind of run into the same problem as you see um, with uh, the doxalamine. These tend to be a little bit more potent, a little bit more sedating, um, because, but they also help with the, the nausea and vomiting because they block those, uh, some dopamine receptors as well. That can be somewhat useful um, for, for treatment of that. So, um, and actually in some cases, we'll talk about this later on, but there's actually risk for extrapyramidal effects, which are kind of Parkinson's-like effects due to its dopamine blockade. We'll talk more about that in the behavioral section coming up a little bit later on, okay? Um, so the next thing you have here is going to be our serotonin three receptor antagonist. Remember, 5-HT is just another, 5-hydroxytryptamine uh, is another name for, for serotonin. But if you have 5-HT three receptor blockers or antagonists, this is where your Zofran comes into play here. So on Dancitron, or Zofran is probably the most common one being used. I kind of mentioned that uh, in that, that pregnancy slide a little bit earlier where it said, you know, hey, it's a B category drug now, and it got that because it was used so often. Um, nice thing about these drugs, they are really non-sedating. So if you need to have someone who needs to drive around and be productive and not be you know, groggy at work or school or whatever, uh, Dancitron is a really good option for that from that standpoint. It tends to be a little bit more expensive uh, than something like a Phenergan or a Doxalamine. Um, but again, some people find it to be, you know, well worth the money because uh, that nausea and vomiting can be you know pretty detrimental to their quality of life that they're having to throw up every five minutes or so or even just all that dry heaving can be really you know detrimental to them so um some people say so is worth more than its weight in gold uh which i probably believe some of them based on how bad the nausea and vomiting can get and um don't have a ton of data on the lactation, um, but again, typically uh, a lot of that nausea and vomit kind of clears up after the pregnancy has occurred, um, but it could still most likely be safe for, for most women afterwards as well. Um, we'll talk more about those in the GI section, though, so just kind of keep this in your mind. Just be familiar with the mechanism. Be familiar. Those are kind of the most common ones you'll run into. Um, usually you see granacetron and dolacetron more often used uh, for like chemo-induced nausea and vomiting. So really the big one to remember is on Dancitron or Zofran. That's the most common one you're going to run into and most likely one I'll probably like ask about like on a test or something from this category. So again, keep the mechanisms in mind. No, it's non-sedating. No, it's a good go-to, but usually uh, as a backup, if the doxamine pyridoxine combination is not going to be a good option for those, uh, those women. Okay.
Um, as far as treatment for heartburn goes, again, uh, more frequent, smaller meals can be very useful to help with that. Um, typically, you want to be careful with antacids, and you kind of use them in moderation. Uh, we'll talk more about antacids later, but as you might imagine, how do they work? neutralize acids, right? So your stomach acids get neutralized by having a, a base. So like calcium carbonate or Tums is one of the more common ones you're going to run into. Um, you want to be careful with certain ones like sodium bicarbonate um, and magnesium because, again, you can cause some electrolyte shifts there. So things like Tums, calcium carbonate tends to be a little bit more uh, uh, safe from that standpoint. But again, you don't want to use it too, too frequently. Um, Caraphate or sucralfate is another one that is used occasionally. Um, this one is prescription only. A lot of the antacids are available over the counter, so it's easier for them to get a hold of. Um, but caraphate is uh, nice because it kind of coats the stomach and kind of help neutralize some of those acids. Uh, so some people will benefit from that. And that those are not working because, again, antacids are nice because really they don't have a lot of systemic effects, right? Because most of them are just going to be um, bases plus some sort of, uh, you know, cation there. It's like, you know, sodium bicarbonate or calcium carbonate. Those are typical things your body's exposed to anyway. So those are really going to be pretty safe from a uh, pregnancy standpoint. If you needed something working a little bit more systemically, this is where we're going to get into our H2 blockers. And so these are going to be things that block histamine. Uh, you know, specifically we talk about H1 blockers working more centrally in the CNS. It's where like your uh, diphenhydramine, your doxylamine are working. H2 receptors are primarily found in the stomach and they, uh, support or uh, enhance you know, uh, acid secretion there. So H2 blockers can be useful to help block that histamine effect and reduce the amount of acid the, the patient's actually producing. So this is where your like ranitidine, famotidine start to come up here. Uh, they can be used as, uh, as good agents. They are pretty old drugs. They've been around for a while. Typically are pretty safe for the most part. But again, this is a good backup if you know, something like an antacid is not working too well. And then uh, we also have our proton pump inhibitors. You've heard of those before? Anyone know any examples? Pro Omeprazole, your Prilosec, which is uh, Isomeprazole. I'm sorry, uh, no, I'm sorry. Prilosec is uh, Omeprazole. Nexium is Isomeprazole. There's Pantoprazole, which is Protonix. Uh, Lansoprazole, which is Prevacid. So you got a couple different options out there. Those are probably uh, safe as well. And again, if you cover them in GI section, you know they actually block those actual proton pumps that are meant to be spinning out the actual acid themselves. Tend to be more potent than your H2 blockers, but um, we don't. They're newer drugs, and we don't have as much evidence of safety with them. They're also, for the most part, some of them have gone over the counter, so they are still available to some degree. But they're generally more expensive than your H2 blockers. So um, again, cost is always a concern. So if you can go something cheap, that's always going to be better uh, as well for these patients. Uh, as far as constipation goes, uh, typically we can do things like try to increase their fiber intake, uh, increase the amount of water in their diet. Um, again, their blood volume is going to go up anyway, so they're probably going to be kind of thirsty uh, in the first place. So that can be uh, useful to try to help to kind of lubricate the stool, make it a little bit easier to pass in a lot of cases. And some moderate exercise is going to be good. Um, I wouldn't recommend CrossFit to any you know, pregnant patients, but uh, just you know, getting up, walking around may be useful to kind of help stimulate the GI tract a little bit there. Um, typically, we like to use bulk forming laxatives. Anyone know how those might work? You had a guess? Bulk forming laxatives? Sounds gross when I say it that way, doesn't it? They kind of just increase the mass, right? So they're usually going to be things that absorb water. They, they increase that size. When you get that increased pressure in the colon because it's expanding out, it's going to cause peristalsis, right? So that's that, that reflex uh, response we talked about way back in physiology, right? So feeling that mass uh, effect is going to cause stimulation of the GI tract uh, to try to uh, get rid of that feces there. So that can be uh, very useful. So think about things like your metamucil, things like your methyl cellulose, psyllium husk. These are nice. These are drugs of choice because they don't get absorbed systemically. So there's very low risk of any exposure to the fetus because again they're sticking right there in the GI tract it's just absorbing water kind of building a bulk and then uh, stimulating defecation right so those are beneficial um, other things that could be used include like surfactants um, these are basically things that just help lubricate the stool so this is like your docusate uh, the most uh, uh, other common ones you may use those also tend to be pretty safe but again if we don't have a lot of exposure um, history hard to get that evidence there to say how safe it is so it's probably see it's probably pretty safe but again bulk forming is our drug of choice here now, um, some other ones we're starting to use more often uh, is probably going to be polyethylene glycol or Miralax, which everyone has uh, seen that at least like on the counters or you know the shelves of CVS or something. Uh, this one used to be prescription only, so it was harder to get a hold of, but now that it's available over the counter, this is another very safe one. Again, this is going to just um, uh, you know trap a lot of fluid with it. Again, kind of uh, uh, increase that mass effect to, to stimulate defecation. This one's also probably going to be pretty safe to use. Tends to be more expensive than some of your other kind of traditional bulk formers like methyl cellulose, but can be a good option for those patients, right?
Typically, we try to avoid stimulants, and again, we'll cover this again when we get to GI, but stimulants are not going to be quite so good because um, you only want to use these kind of intermittently. So if you guys heard of like the stimulant laxatives at all, like Senna, or, or talk about any problems with them, using them chronically, the GI tract gets really used to having a stimulant effect around. So if you use it every single day consistently, um, your GI tract really needs that stimulant in order to stimulate defecation. Otherwise, if it's not there, you can find you can have like a kind of rebound constipation. So really only recommend these uh, the stimulants like Senna or Bisacodyl pretty occasionally, not routinely, uh, like you could use like a bulk former like methyl cellulose. Okay. Um, some people use mineral oil. Again, that's probably okay just occasionally, um, but you can actually see some issues with fat-soluble vitamins because mineral oils tend to be very uh, lipophilic and kind of trap some of those from the GI tract. So it um, can limit some of the nutrient intake, which, which they need because they're growing another person. Okay. Um, in order to avoid hemorrhoids, if you can avoid constipation, that's going to be the number one thing you can do. So that's going to be beneficial to them. Uh, we also like to use some topical products. Because again, topical is going to be better. It's going to allow for less exposure to the fetus. Um, and so that can be uh, a very useful versus the internal products. Because again, the rectum tends to be very vascular, tends to be a good source of uh, drug absorption. So if you can just keep it, kind of keep it topical, um, that's going to limit that exposure. And so this is where we can use something like preparation H. Again, preparation A through G's were duds. But preparation H, that was the one that worked, right? Um, these usually contain things like hydrocortisone as like an anti-inflammatory, kind of deal with that. Um, or they can include things like phenylephrine. Uh, anyone know why you'd have phenylephrine uh, used for treatment of a hemorrhoid? What is a hemorrhoid? Yeah, so it's like a basic kind of a, this is kind of blown out kind of blood vessel there uh, at the rectum. So if I can use a vasoconstrictor like phenylephrine that has that nice local activity to vasoconstrict and try to uh, shrink that down somewhat uh, to allow it to kind of heal and, and, and get better. So that's usually what you find in preparation H. Or you might use uh, like an astringent, like a, a tux pad, which has witch hazel in it, which tends to cause a, a, um, that tissue to kind of shrink down uh, as it tightens there. So that's another thing. Sits bass may also be useful as well um, uh, to kind of help uh, heal kind of that injured kind of area. And then if they have diarrhea, uh, you're going to find that stool forming uh, laxatives can also be useful as well because they can kind of help trap a lot of that excess water that's there in the colon, so that can be very useful. And occasionally you might use a drug called loperamide. This is actually kind of interesting because um, loperamide itself actually has opioid-like properties. If you're familiar with opioids, which we'll talk about in the ortho section uh, a couple of weeks from now, um, you're going to find that, uh, that opioids typically do what to the GI tract? Slow. Slow it down, right? They cause a lot of constipation. So if you can uh, have a drug that actually works uh, peripherally actually does not get systemically at all uh, to cause you know analgesia and euphoria or anything it just works on the GI tract specifically to try to slow things down um, again I don't like to use that as commonly but stool forming laxatives tend to be uh, or, or um, bulk forming laxatives I should say um, are going to be the the drug of choice for, for diarrhea all right uh, any questions from the first half all right, so continuing on, so talking about pregnancy-induced hypertension, a um, couple of different ways you can break this out. So chronic hypertension would be those patients that had hypertension beforehand, kind of go into pregnancy with it, and also those that will develop it before 20 weeks gestation, that would still be considered kind of a chronic hypertension. And when we have a uh, uh, Hypertension that occurs, this is called gestational hypertension. Uh, this is when they develop a blood pressure over 140 over 90. So pretty, you guys are pretty familiar with that, that definition there as far as uh, the blood pressure cutoff. Um, but they also have the absence of proteinuria. So I mentioned they're having a lot bigger amount of urine or uh, renal blood flow, GFRs going up. They also tend to be more likely to get pro uh, proteinuria happening here when they, as they get more hypertensive. And then they will uh, transition from gestational hypertension up to mild preeclampsia. Uh, as they start to see that the hypertension is being accompanied by that proteinuria. So they might do like a measurement. If you get, say, more than 300 milligrams in 24 hours, that would be like a cutoff. I'm not going to quiz you on that specifically, but just know uh, this is kind of the progression from gestational hypertension, mild preeclampsia. And you can see this, you know, is, is not totally uncommon. About 6 to 8% of pregnancies get afflicted with this, uh, unfortunately. With, uh, the more dangerous things that pop up and can kind of get more emergent, we have this severe preeclampsia. This is where you're kind of exceeding uh, proteinuria, certain cutoffs, like five grams in 24 hours. You're sending out for, for a lot of, a lot of uh, protein there. And this is also if the BP is getting high enough, like say 160 over 110, and you're starting to get things like severe headache or other kind of uh, signs and symptoms associated with really severe hypertension. So you see things like visual disturbances, epigastric pain experience. Those will all be things to say, okay, yeah, it's probably severe preeclampsia. We should probably do something about this before too long. 
because if they progress any further than that, it's what we call eclampsia. And this is where they actually develop uh, tonic-clonic seizures um, that are related to this hypertension, right? So again, the treatment modality is going to be very different. You're not going to give phenytoin uh, to these women. Uh, this is uh, You need to deal with the hypertension. You need to get the blood pressure down. And that's going to be the biggest thing you can do to fix their, their issues. So... Non-drug management, we can do things like uh, activity restriction. Uh, this can be useful for some of them. Um, but you have to think about things like bed rest. They're laid up in bed all the time. The risk for venous thromboembolism does go up, and they tend to, as we mentioned, already be in a hypercoagulable state. That is a concern. There are ways we can get around that. Anyone know a non-drug way you can help to prevent VTEs? SCDs. So VTE treated with the SCDs. It's a little bit of alphabet soup. What's an SCD stand for? Yeah, sequential compression device. They're kind of these stocking devices that will uh, apply pressure to different parts like the calf and the lower extremity uh, to try to uh, you know, kind of keep that venous blood flowing so it doesn't just sit there and pool and, and eventually cause a, a clot to occur there. Some stress reduction can be useful as well. Um, again, this can be a very stressful time for some of these ladies, so that can be uh, helpful. And then some mild exercise, um, just kind of getting up, walking around, you know, things like that. Nothing too strenuous. Um, they found that some women actually benefit from calcium. So they may get, say, one to two grams daily. And this may decrease that relative risk of hypertension by about 30% and preeclampsia by 48%. So I've seen that in some studies. Uh, and again, if they're taking a prenatal vitamin uh, throughout the pregnancy, then um, that, that probably does include a decent amount of calcium already. But they may need some additional supplementation above that. Um, so that could be one thing that's useful. And then uh, kind of a unique thing, uh, which we uh, you don't necessarily associate with being a antihypertensive, but it's actually magnesium sulfate. So this can actually be used um, to treat these eclamptic seizures that, that pop up here. And so I've, uh, you'll probably see the most kind of gung-ho aggressive magnesium use as far as doses and how much they're giving on a labor and delivery ward when you're dealing with these kind of complicated pregnancies. We give a ton of magnesium. So anyone know why we might use magnesium? Uh, for a patient with this hypertension, I've alluded to it before. Yeah, it's actually vasodilator. So think of magnesium as kind of the body's natural calcium channel blocker. So if you think about it working similar to something like a dihydropyridine, where it'll actually help uh, to cause vasodilation, will relax that vascular smooth muscle, uh, that is what we're going to use. And so this would be used as an IV uh, uh, drug. You know, the, the calcium supplementation, that's PO, they'd be taking that every day. This would be like kind of like an IV big bolus of magnesium, try to get that vasodilation to occur, get their blood pressure under control. And that should help to manage uh, the seizures in that case. And so typically, if you think about magnesium doses, like you think someone who's coding, uh, who's having you know, a cardiac arrest, you're going to give them magnesium. Usually like a dose is like two grams. You give them two grams of magnesium. That uh, can be useful for certain uh, types of arrhythmias and things like that. You guys remember the treatment for torsades? Magnesium. We give them like two grams of magnesium if they were in torsades. Uh, that would be in the, uh, the treatment for that. Here we're giving like four to six grams of magnesium. We're giving a big, big boluses of magnesium over a relatively short time frame. So 15 to 20 minutes or so. They're kind of just pounding those magnesium in. And then they'll get a continuous infusion afterwards. So again, big, big doses. Um, Typically, you should avoid things like benzodiazepines and phenytoin. Uh, phenytoin itself is detrimental to the fetus, uh, potentially, and then also actual uh, benzodiazepines are also teratogenic as well. And again, this doesn't really fix the underlying problem for why they're having a seizure, which is why it's so important. You know, like when you're having an uh, uh, infant with a febrile seizure, give them some Tylenol. They don't necessarily need to have Ativan to, to break their seizure. Uh, look at the, the pathophysiology, look at the underlying cause. So try to get their blood pressure under control, and that's the best thing for their seizures. So um, if they're having kind of chronic management of this hypertension, so again, these are uh, not really at the eclamptic stage yet, but these are things we can do to try to prevent them from progressing to that. We can use a couple of different drugs here. Um, so one good one is labetalol. This is a third generation beta blocker, if you remember. So it has some kind of mixed actions there. So it's going to have some alpha blocking properties as well, because blocking alpha receptors in the blood vessel should do what? Should vasodilate, right? Because alpha uh, activation should cause constriction, just like we talked about phenylephrine being treated, uh, used topically for a hemorrhoid. That's a vasoconstrictor. If we block alpha, it should cause vasodilation. So that can be uh, useful in addition to the beta blocking properties uh, as well. So this is actually starting to be used um, first line in a lot of places, depending on kind of where they're practicing, kind of what their, their habits are. But um, we will use oral labetalol for kind of chronic management, for managing their blood pressure throughout the pregnancy. Um, but uh, for acute treatment, if they're becoming more clamptic, this is where you could use IV uh, bolus dosing to try to get their blood pressure under control as well. So they might be using this in addition to the magnesium. Uh, could be a good option there.
Previously, they used to a drug called methyl dopa. Um, this is one that actually works uh, similar to clonidine. If you think back to your hypertension lectures, we talked about clonidine. That works on as a sympatholytic, so it's working on those presynaptic alpha-2 receptors to cause uh, a decrease in the release of catecholamines, a decrease that amount of uh, norepinephrine uh, being released, causing vasoconstriction. So by decreasing that, um, this will have very similar effects to uh, uh, clonidine. Right? So I think methyl dopa, same activity as clonidine. You guys remember the other antihypertensive that had the same mechanism. Sometimes I use it for ADHD. So guanfacine. So guanfacine was the other one um, that kind of fit in that same category of these drugs working on the alpha-2 receptors, right? So anyway, so again, decreasing that sympathetic alpha also should drop their blood pressure. Um, again, libatol tends to be a little bit safer, uh, fewer side effects. So this is why uh, it's becoming more of a drug of choice rather than uh, the methyl dopa itself. Um, in some cases, and we'll talk about... Um, using calcium channel blockers, but typically we would use dihydropyridines. Uh, so we'll look at nifedipine a little bit later. You can actually use this for women who are having kind of um, premature contractions. So we'll look at that a little, uh, a little bit later on, but uh, this can have kind of a dual benefit. They're hypertensive and having premature contractions. Um, you give a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. Because um, you might imagine uh, that uterine smooth muscle when you have a contraction, the squeezing down, if you can block those calcium channels, that should allow for some relaxation. So that's why you can have a DHP kind of pulling a dual mechanism there. Um, and then other agents you might use occasionally. Um, so nitroglycerin could be another good vasodilator that you could use for acute treatment if you needed to. So that would be a, an okay option. And then have I mentioned nitroprusside before? I believe I mentioned it briefly. Remember the toxic chemical it contains within it? Cyanide. It actually has cyanide in it. So that is another one we can use. Um, we would give with another drug called sodium thiocyanide. Sodium thiosulfide that actually binds up that cyanide, but uh, the nitroprusside is another very good kind of acute IV short acting um, uh, vasodilator. So those are all good options. Again, uh, if they're really eclamptic, they're having seizures, magnesium is a drug of choice though. That's one we're going to go with as, as the acute treatment there. Okay, and then next up you have gestational diabetes. And so really we see that any degree of glucose intolerance tends to be... Um, not great. So again, you can see this with any pregnancy, but uh, see with some women, they get it on subsequent pregnancies. So the first one, the sugars might be great, and then on subsequent pregnancies, they may not um, uh, may not have the same sort of insulin resistance as they saw the first, or they may develop more insulin resistance. And you see this affects you know a decent number of pregnancies, about seven percent or so, especially if they had any kind of pre-existing. Um, insulin resistance. So if they had type 2 diabetes or any kind of like metabolic syndrome, things like that, they're related back to insulin resistance. This can be worse in, uh, with the pregnancy. And typically, we screen women in around 24 to 28 weeks gestation. And you know how we screen them? Give them a whole bunch of sugar and see how they see how they handle it, right? So we'll talk about OGTTs in just a second here. But usually, you're going to find that if a woman did have insulin resistance, did have gestational diabetes, this would resolve after the pregnancy. Um, but they may be at higher risk for having type 2 diabetes later on in life. So that would be one thing to consider. Also, there's some risk uh, for the child as well that might actually develop uh, diabetes. But um, definitely for the, uh, the, the mom, there's some risk. So we will use an oral glucose tolerance test or an OGTT. Uh, I don't know if anyone in here, uh, any moms have had to drink uh, the solution before, but I hear it's very gross. Uh, this is kind of like really uh, sugar laden kind of Gatorade looking solution uh, that they'll use. And basically uh, there's a couple different methods you can use, uh, but the, basically the, the mom would go in and she is in a fasting state and she would get uh, a baseline blood sugar done. And then you would do, um, uh, depending on the, the method here, you could do like a two-step method where they get 50 grams of dextrose uh, first, and then they would do a, this called a one hour glucose challenge. They would test the blood sugar after one hour, and then they could do a, a second step. They give 100 grams, and they would do a three hour glucose challenge. So it basically test the, the blood sugar at three hours. That's one way to do it. Um, actually, what a lot of people do nowadays, because it's a little bit uh, easier, is to do just this uh, this one-step method where you have a two-hour, 75 grams. So this is kind of like the happy medium between these two, where you just go in fasting, um, get the 75 grams, uh, on a, get your fasting blood sugar, take the 75 grams, and then you get a, a two-hour reading. And that will kind of give you an idea of what their baseline sh insulin resistance is, because if their sugar already comes back uh, resting uh, stay high, then you know there's, there's some resistance there. Um, and then you can see how their body's actually processing a big sugar bolus like that um, by seeing what the two hour is. Um, and so you would make this diagnosis based on, you know, uh, if the, you know, the overt diabetes was not diagnosed beforehand. So like looking at their A1C, if that wasn't already, you know, sky high to begin with, they were looking at that fasting glucose. It was kind of interesting. I'm sure my wife would not mind me sharing this, but uh, for her first pregnancy, um, no problems with her sugars. Uh, she did the two hour, came back, no problems. So everything was fine and dandy. For the second one, though, she came back with a two hour one. Fasting was okay, but her second, her, her two hour sugar was actually a little bit above the 
um, uh, the limit there, what they consider to be, uh, you know, uh, insulin resistance. And so the doctor's like, well, you got gestational diabetes. And she's like, well, crap, what does that mean? They said, okay, well, this is the two hour. Let's do a three hour to see if that's really true or not. So they actually went back, did a three hour. Uh, so that's a kind of a, a better confirmatory kind of diagnosis. Uh, and it still came back a little high. So she was really bummed about that. But it was interesting. So uh, at that point, her ob referenced her out to a uh, high-risk doc because she is technically of advanced maternal age. Don't tell her that. Um, <laughs> she hates that fact. But she is technically AMA. Um, and so she went to the specialist. And what's kind of interesting is she went to this guy, uh, and, and basically he said, well, you know what, your resting is fine. That's really what we care about because that's generally what you're going to be at for the most, most part. Um, and so I'm going to say you don't have gestational diabetes. So depending on who the expert is you're talking to, um, they may or may not. Not, um, make the same conclusion just based off these results. But this is typically what a lot of women go through um, just to determine if they have that gestational diabetes. Um, yeah, so again, that's one of those things because, you know, uh, uh, if they do have gestational diabetes, there is risk for the fetus. Uh, they have more risk for complications. And so, of course, you know, the, the docs want to know about that so that way they can make, you know, any kind of appropriate decisions about what to do with the mom. Anyway. Uh, for treatment, so they actually do have gestational diabetes, um, dietary modification is going to be super key here. So obviously they can kind of go cut out some of the carbs uh, they're consuming. Uh, it can be uh, useful to some degree. And again, more exercise is always going to be beneficial here. Um, but the drug of choice is actually going to be insulin. As you might imagine, uh, insulin your body produces anyway. So of course, it might be pretty safe for you to, to receive. So we're using insulin here. Um, it actually only has a category B. So even insulin, which your body produces, not uh, not an A category drug. But uh, the big uh, benefit here is because insulin is a protein, it's a fairly large uh, protein. It actually does not cross the placenta. Um, so really, there's no uh, risk for like fetal hypoglycemia as long as the mom herself doesn't actually get hypoglycemic. So that's kind of a benefit with that one. Now, we'll talk about these drugs later on when we get to the endocrine section and talk about uh, uh, diabetes, but a few other ones. We have a class of drugs called sulfonylureas, and these are going to be drugs that actually stimulate your pancreas to release more insulin directly. So a good example of that is glyburide. Um, this one is could be relatively safe, but again, it's going to be um, not as safe as insulin. So, uh, and anyone know how you have to administer insulin? Primarily subcutaneously. So uh, the benefit of using something like glyburide or metformin is that they're oral medications. But again, um, a lot of people, especially if they are otherwise healthy before the pregnancy, they don't want all of a sudden have to start injecting themselves. So that's kind of the the kind of the concern with that from a patient standpoint. Uh, but insulin's still drug of choice, but some people may not like that, and, and so these are backup options. Um, the other thing would be metformin. It's actually an insulin sensitizer, and this actually helps the liver to process glucose a bit more efficient, uh, efficiently. And also the skeletal muscle will take up glucose more readily, helps the insulin that you produce already to work a little bit better, which is uh, beneficial. We'll see metformin is really a kind of a cornerstone for therapy for type 2 diabetes when um, we get to endocrine section. Um, but again, we don't have a ton of information, so we think it's probably not triadogenic, but it's hard to say. You know, It's one of those things where if it's a one in a million sort of thing, you have to treat a million pregnant women to, before you kind of find those, those issues. So uh, again, insulin probably going to be the safest. Anyone know what other routes you can give insulin? Hmm? IV. You can give IV. That is true. That will, that will work. What else? Huh? I haven't seen any intranasal ones. There might be some development of that, um, uh, but uh, inhale is another option. So uh, again, insulin is not good for oral use because uh, it's too big of a protein, but they've had some inhaled versions. Uh, they typically are not like super great and they tend to be expensive. So there's one they had years ago that went off market, but there's a, I think there's another one that's out there now. But typically sub-Q, uh, if you're in the hospital setting, sometimes IV, they'll, they'll administer that. But anyway. So um, Going on to thromboembolism, so we mentioned they're in a hypercoagulable state. Uh, we see that the, the risk for VTE tends to go about five to tenfold uh, in those pregnant patients. And we mentioned warfarin already is kind of a no good drug. It's uh, it's category D. We know that. Um, and why do you think that is? You know, mechanistically, why do you think that would be a problem for a fetus? Is rat poison? Yes, I would concede that it is rat poison. Little fetuses, what are they if not tiny rats? <laughs> they have little tails. And they look really funky when they're on the ultrasound. I'm just kidding. Uh, no, well, actually, if you think about it, like, if, how does warfarin work? What vitamin does it affect? Vitamin K. Vitamin K is super important in the liver to producing uh, all sorts of things, not only clotting factors. So you imagine, uh, you know, anytime you're uh, monkeying around with fat-soluble vitamins, especially in, in fetuses, is, is no good. So again, anything affecting uh, vitamin D, A, E, any of those are, are not great. So again, if you imagine warfarin affecting vitamin K, it's not, not a good idea for the fetus. So um, 
Instead, what we can give are drugs that don't really cross the placenta um, that are still going to be effective at treating uh, the clotting factors that are circulating in, in the mom or cell. So this is where um, our heparins come into play. So heparin is kind of going to be our go-to class of drugs that we can use in order to, to manage this hypercoagulable state. Um, so uh, the typical drug of choice we're going to see here is going to be our low molecular weight heparins. So again, remember they have unfractionated heparin, which is the big long kind of sugar molecule of heparin itself. Uh, and then you have the kind of chopped up version, which are going to be things like your anoxaparin or lovinox, I mean, kind of your, your go-to one. You guys remember any difference in activity between those two? Remember, un unfractionated heparin tends to work pretty equally against which two main factors? 10 and think about driving a car. 10 and 2, right? So 10 and 2 are the big ones. It affects some other ones as well, as you guys will remember if you dig back through the cobwebs. But 10 and 2 are the big ones. Um, and oxaparin tends to be more uh, effective against which one? 10, much more selective against 10. So imagine you're kind of like riding, kind of relaxing a little bit in your car. So only 10 is, is uh, noxaparin. So um, typically that's recommended uh, due to the fact that it has a longer half-life and so you don't have to administer it quite as frequently. But a lot of times you can give you know, noxaparin once a day uh, for prevention of, of a clot. Uh, if you have a treatment of a clot, it's typically twice a day. But uh, on the other hand, you have something like unfractionated heparin. For prevention of clots, you may have to give it like three times a day. And how do these drugs get administered? These are also sub Q. These are big enough um, uh, molecules that they, uh, uh, or they, they really don't get absorbed well through the GI tract, and so we have to give these uh, subcutaneously. So again, the patients have to inject themselves. Again, not ideal, but again, you think about the risk versus benefits to the fetus. Uh, you know, a little bit of pain for a mom injecting these drugs probably going to outweigh the the potential risk for for having a clot. So, um, warfarin is no good though. It's a known teratogen. We don't like that. And, and again, heparin could work and we used it for a good long time before the low molecular weight heparins came about, but nowadays an oxaparin is kind of your go-to. Um, now, as soon as the baby comes out, does not mean mom has gone back down to her baseline yet. It takes some time to kind of get back to the pre-pregnant state. And so you would actually continue treatment, uh, for, uh, the mom throughout the pregnancy and then for six weeks afterwards. So, um, typically they'll recommend a minimum total of three months, uh, to prevent any further clots from occurring, uh, and, and which case they should be down back at baseline and then they can kind of come off of that. So it's not a lifetime thing by any means. Um, and again, it's just a matter of, you know, do they have an actual clot? You start with the treatment and then you can kind of put them on a more prophylaxis dose uh, versus if they're just known to be in a hypercoagulable state at baseline and you want to make sure uh, they're high risk enough, you want to treat them before the clot occurs, you just use prophylactic dosing throughout. Kind of make sense? Okay. Uh, some other acute conditions that can pop up uh, with some regularity for pregnant patients. So UTIs, um, you always treat. So even if you have someone who has asymptomatic bacteria, uh, if they're pregnant, you want to go ahead and treat that. Why do you think that is? Hmm? Yeah, so... Yeah, you have you have risk of the the infection spreading potentially and causing uh, uh, you know worse problems for mom. So you don't want that to happen. So you want to go ahead and treat that uh, any of those asymptomatic bacteria areas. Um, this is where you can use a drug. We didn't really mention this uh, uh, back in the antibiotic section, but nitrofurantoin tones one used um, routinely for UTIs. It tends to accumulate in the in the kidneys and in the bladder and it helps to to treat those kind of local infections. Um, Macrobit is a typical brand name you'll see for that one. That one actually is a category B, so this one would be fine. Um, but it does not actually cover uh, proteus species. So if you came back growing uh, proteus species in the urine, this would not be a good uh, drug for that. So you'd have to use something else. Basically, this one's just working by inhibiting uh, the kind of carbohydrate metabolism that occurs in the bacteria and helps to disrupt the cell wall. So kind of similar to a little bit to, to like a penicillin or something from a cell wall active standpoint. Um, amoxicillin uh, can be a good option as well. This will cover proteus, but um, you do have to worry about things like resistant E. coli coming up. So especially if they have a history of recurrent UTI, it may not be the best option. It kind of depends on on uh, on the patient there. And acephalosporin would be fine as well. So you can use something like Keflex, uh, Ceftonir, you know, anything like that would be would typically be fine. Really, you're going to look to see once you see the bacteria, you start treatment with something, and then once the results come back as far from a culture, then you can kind of get a better idea of what, what you're dealing with there. And then all of them are also compatible with breastfeeding, so those are fine as well. It's typically, antibiotics don't have an easy time really crossing the placenta or the other breast milk uh, for the most part. Really, really safe drugs uh, in general. As far as pain goes, um, you know, various pains and aches can come about from pregnancy. Um, typically, acetaminophen is your drug of choice has a relatively um, wide amount of safety data saying, hey, you know, we don't see any issues from pregnant women receiving this. Um, so category B, this one's fine to use for, for pregnant women. As I mentioned with NSAIDs, 
fine for the first two uh, trimesters, but you worry about that third trimester where it turns into a category D because um, this is where you have that premature closure of the ductus arteriosus. You kind of monkey around the fetal blood flow. It's not going to be any good, right? Because they need that circulation to occur from the venous arterial side. Um, what's interesting though is if you have a patient who comes out and it turns out they actually have a congenital uh, heart defect, what sometimes we'll actually give in order to maintain that blood flow between the venous and arterial side, we'll actually give prostaglandins in order to keep that open. So if you ever see like a, a baby that's just born, they get put on an alprostadil drip, that is a drug that actually keeps that ductus arteriosus open because it's a prostaglandin, right? So it works just the same as what they should have been producing on their own or, or they're not producing anymore after they're born. So again, NSAIDs will close down that ductus arteriosus and then uh, prostaglandins will open it back up. In some cases, we actually give uh, neonates who come out who don't have that closure. Um, we will actually give them occasionally IV ibuprofen and that will close it for us occasionally. Uh, if that doesn't work, then sometimes we'll have to do like a surgical ligation, but typically uh, the ibuprofen uh, works pretty well. That kind of makes sense? So again, in the, uh, in the womb, probably not a good idea in the third trimester, but once they're out, then it may be uh, therapeutically useful. Uh, and occasionally you can consider things like morphine if they're having really severe uh, pain issues. Um, tends to be uh, a B drug in, in, for the most part, especially in the first and second trimester, but really short periods of time are really important here. So just like morphine, I mean, it works just the same as heroin does. Um, you can develop tolerance, you can develop addiction to it, uh, and the baby gets just as uh, tolerant to it as, as the mom does. And so you can find this is where they have that withdrawal syndrome that occurs uh, after they're born. They get very irritable, very fussy, it's difficult to control them, they have issues with their temperature, and they don't feed well, all kinds of problems. And so sometimes you'll see these babies, you have to give them uh, methadone uh, doses uh, in order to, to try to kind of meet the, their opioid needs and then gently wean them down off of over the course of weeks to, to months of uh, not super uh, uh, fun to do, but you know it's a it's an unfortunate thing we run into uh, with, with some some common uh, somewhat commonplace. Okay, and then looking at mental health during pregnancy, um, so we find that you know psychiatric illness is probably underreported. It affects probably half a uh, million pregnancies each year, and, and then you see not only just depression itself, but also a lot of anxiety that can come about uh, from this as well. Um, you, know, you know, think about 10 to 16 percent of pregnant women experience you know some sort of uh, anxiety or depression associated with their pregnancy. Um, and you'll find that most women, even if they had it before they got pregnant, they'll discontinue use of their medications, um, whether or whether or not their provider recommended it, um, just due to that concern for, for fetal exposure, which you imagine like, okay, well, now I'm on this medication for anxiety and now I'm pregnant, but what if this is hurting the baby? It's going to cause more anxiety and see, kind of see how it can be kind of a sick cycle there. So this is where it's really important. Patient education is super, super important because um, it's important these women get treated appropriately for their, their mental health issues. So um, the probably the most common one you, you hear reference to is this postpartum depression. It's called the postpartum blues. Um, can this be potentially dangerous? Absolutely, yeah. So I mean, you know, it's where you get kind of just thoughts that you know you would never thought think would pop in your head like of harming yourself or harming your baby and it's something that just that occurs and it's no fault of anyone um, but it's important that we recognize that and we educate our patients on that they're being treated appropriately for it so and about 10 percent of childbearing women will experience uh, postpartum depression so you know it's not uncommon this will, this will occur and it can happen within the first month or so after uh, childbirth typically um, so, so we have an increased desire to treat by physicians, which is a good thing, and, and more, um, again, uh, the, the stigma against mental health, I think, is starting to, to decline somewhat, and so I think more people are able to talk about it, able to have a healthy conversation, and, and bring it up. So how do we treat this? We'll talk about these drugs more in the behavioral section coming up next, but we'll just kind of mention them briefly here, but I'm, as I'm sure you've already uh, have heard about these. These are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. Anyone know how these work? selectively inhibit serotonin reuptake. Oh, good, that's familiar. It's nice when they put it right in the name, right? Um, so basically, normally our synapses, you know, our, neur our neurons like to recycle neurotransmitters. So if they have a serotonin neuron, spits out serotonin, wants to recycle that through a reuptake uh, transporter. And so uh, it's, you know, efficient doing that, but if we can block those transporters, that will leave more serotonin out in the synapse. And is that how it treats depression? <laughs> 
Well, fine. It's actually not. You can increase those serotonin levels. That's not actually the, the real thing that treats depression. We actually don't know why the SSRIs work so well. There's probably a very complicated metabolic change that occurs when exposed to these drugs, but they, they work, right? They, they are effective for treating depression and anxiety. And we'll, we'll cover that more in detail later on. But these tend to be very effective agents. Um, you'll find that uh, as time goes on, we're going to have more evidence showing uh, their efficacy and then possible um, safety concerns uh, from a fetal standpoint. Um, again, it's one of those things where, like, you know, if the mom could be really really depressive and potentially suicidal like the the risks and the benefits have to be uh kind of weighed there to kind of figure out what, what's best for that, that potential um patient it's actually interesting is that moms who are uh on ssrs throughout pregnancy if you have the the fetus come out um uh, the baby's born and they can actually have withdrawal syndromes from the actual ssri so if you guys are uh, i don't know if you covered it in your uh, behavioral section yet um, but if you come off of an ssri you can have withdrawal symptoms from that and it can be pretty un uncomfortable for the patient same thing happened to a, a fetus so it was kind of a cool case we had one time when i was in fellowship where we got called the nicu they said we got this baby we just can't figure out what the heck's going on mom was uh you know relatively healthy otherwise and, and, and you know, we just can't figure out what's going on with this baby. So we're kind of looking through it. And we actually found that the mom was taking, uh, uh, I believe it was Paxil she was taking. Uh, and, you know, baby came out not being exposed to Paxil anymore. Now they're having, actually having acute withdrawal uh, to that. So it's kind of an interesting little, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's some case reports that kind of backed us up making that kind of assumption there. But uh, it was a pretty uh, interesting case. Anywho, uh, we don't know what the long-term effects are going to be. We don't know what effects this will have on, on you know, behavioral issues for the child as they grow up. Hopefully, you know, decades from now, we'll have those kind of studies that say, hey, these kids who are exposed to SSRIs did fine, or they're more likely to develop depression, or who knows? We'll find out, you know, decades. But again, you're treating the mom, you need to do what's best for her uh, initially. So uh, some examples. Anyone know any example SSRIs without looking at the slide? Sertraline. Sertraline or Zoloft is a good one. Fluoxetine. Prozac or fluoxetine is a good one. Effects or so venlafaxine. That's interesting. So I'm glad you mentioned. That. We'll come back to that in a second. That's technically an SNRI. Hmm? So like, yeah. So selects the citalopram. What's the cousin to, or the I guess the left-handed brother of citalopram? There's escitalopram. Remember when I talked about enantiomers uh, and chirality and all of that? So escitalopram is basically uh, one of the, the enantiomers of citalopram. So Lexapro is, is escitalopram. So any of those would be fine. Um, you know, paroxetine or Paxil is another one you can see potentially. Um, Paxil does have a little bit of risk for cardiac malformations in the first trimester. Uh, so that one's probably not recommended too, too often, but I see a lot of fluoxetine, see a lot of sertraline uh, being recommended for these patients. So those are fine. Um, the SNRIs are not going to be as great because what's kind of a common side effect you can see with those? How do they work differently than an SSRI? Norepinephrine. Hmm? Yeah, so they block reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. So you block reuptake of norepinephrine, what do you think that does? To the sympathetic nervous system. It activates, so you can see increase in blood pressure, heart rate. So again, it, it, that may not be as good. I don't know if there's enough uh, evidence out there to support use for those patients or to support use for those drugs. Um, it's I don't know if it's safe or not. It's one of those things, again, where you don't have a lot of good evidence for that. So I'd probably stay away from the SNRIs. Uh, SSRIs are probably fine, though, for, for the most part, if you need to treat this, this uh, depression for these patients. Um, now, occasionally you have older drugs like the tricyclic antidepressants. This is where your uh, amitriptylines, your nortriptylines, your doxepins, things like that fall in, into this category. Um, they may be used as a, uh, as a good backup to SSRIs. Again, not everyone's going to respond super well to an SSRI. You guys know how long it takes SSRIs to kick in? Yeah, four to six weeks or so. So again, it takes time for us to kind of figure this out. But um, if they did not respond well to where they had kind of intolerable side effects, TCAs are okay as a backup. Um, however, the one thing you'll find is that you have to be careful with uh, the TCAs because they're not really as clean uh, from a mechanistic standpoint because they do lots of other things. They're like anticholinergic activities and they block sodium channels, all kinds of stuff. Um, but uh, as you might imagine, anticholinergic activity, what does that do to secretions? If I block acetylcholine at muscarinic receptors, dries things up really uh right so uh, if you think about breast milk if i had an anticholinergic activity there you could potentially uh, slow down you know milk light down and things like that so that, that is a theoretical concern uh, but i'd probably try to avoid tcas and just use ssris if if at all possible but it could be a decent backup Okay, uh, other things with pregnancy. Folic acid is super important. This helps to prevent uh, neural tube defects. So even uh, having four micro, uh, 400 micrograms uh, a day has uh, been shown to really reduce the, the occurrence of neural tube defects. So it's super important that uh, women who are looking to get pregnant are taking you know, some sort of supplement that contains uh, uh, folic acid. 
And then um, you'll find that actually for some women who have a history of having a child with a neural tube defect, they recommend even higher than that. And I actually recommend four milligrams of folic acid. So a big step up there in the uh, in the dose they're going to be giving. And that way if they can have at least one month prior to conception. Um, that will help to um, uh, hopefully stave off any other uh, you know, children being born with the same uh, defects. Um, unfortunately, one of the things with, with folic acid, uh, it's a good education point, is that uh, if a woman found out she's pregnant today uh, and starts taking her prenatal multivitamin, even if it was like the day of conception, um, that folic acid is not going to be as useful as it would be if she's taking it beforehand. So again, if they're thinking about getting pregnant, um, again, it's not, you don't have to be, you know, thinking about getting pregnant, take a prenatal vitamin, um, just get that folic acid in. That's generally going to be safe. So even if you had an accidental pregnancy, you still are covered from that standpoint. So again, it's very, uh, pretty much easily preventable as long as you're getting exposure to this folic acid. But a lot of people don't follow it, so that's why we still see things like neurotrophic defects. Okay, so let's say we want to prevent a pregnancy, or uh, uh, not prevent the pregnancy, we'll talk about that later, but let's say we want to prevent the baby from being born called tocolytic therapy. So again, you know, preventing that that, uh, uh, that contraction of the uterus. Um, this is good to prevent uh, the postponed delivery. And you'll find that these are going to be when there's regular uterine contraction changes uh, with these cervical changes. Four classes that we're going to use. We're going to have some beta agonist. You remember when you activate beta 2 receptors, what does that do in the lungs? Cause a smooth muscle relaxation, right? So you have bronchodilation that happens, like with albuterol. We're going to have a drug called terbutaline, which is going to be a selective beta-2 agonist, similar to albuterol, but we can give this IV. And this will actually cause the same kind of uh, smooth muscle relaxing effect on the uterus itself. So you can give a beta-2 agonist to relax the smooth muscle, same in the lungs, same in the uterus as well, right? So uh, occasionally there's an, uh, a PO version as well, but I'll see this used uh, IV uh, with, with some uh, some regularity for those patients. Uh, magnesium, as I mentioned, may have some calcium channel blocking activity, which could be useful for this, but probably not as good evidence. So some people may use that, some people may not. Um, this is actual one um, uh, I've seen a little bit more commonly. It is going to be the calcium channel blockers. Really, it's the dihydropyridine is not all of the calcium channel blockers, but uh, like nifedipine, I've seen probably the, the most use out of nifedipine. There's a fewer adverse drug events versus some of the other agents. Um, it appears to be pretty efficacious. So, um, or nifedipine, I should say, uh, is, is a good one. Nicardipine is another dihydropyridine. It's usually just given IV for uh, blood pressure management. And then um, they actually see that uh, if you were concerned with the patient actually getting hypotensive, um, but you still want to have that relaxation. Actually, some people had recommended NSAID, so uh, endomethacin is an NSAID you can use, um, and, and that gets around the blood pressure concerns. Yes, ma'am. I would for chronic management. So for instance, I had a, a family member who, who was pregnant. She was having premature contractions. This was like six months in or something. Uh, so she was still pretty early, uh, well before when that baby was uh, you know fully cooked. Uh, and so they actually recommended nifedipine for her over something like terbutaline. Because one, um, with the beta-2 agonist, you guys remember any side effects from albuterol? Yeah, you see some jitteriness. See hypokalemia develop from that because actually it will shuttle potassium into the cells. Uh, have some blood sugar changes. So because of that, you mitigate a lot of the side effects by using just a straight um, dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker. So I'm sorry, like I said, nifedipine started to become more kind of drug of choice from this uh, uh, purpose before they used a lot more tributaline. Yes, ma'am. Oh, this is after delivery. So this is before delivery. This is what we're trying to prevent. So the question is, how early on are you, right? And so again, if you talk to a specialist, they might have a different recommendation. They might say, okay, well, you know, you could use up to this certain point. I'm not sure, but like I said, for most patients, then ifedipine is going to be good. I just kind of list it here just for completeness sake. But you're right, that is absolutely a concern you'd have for the, those patients. Okay. Um, so progesterone you could potentially use. This is kind of a controversial. So, um, for instance, my my sister, her first baby that was born actually was born premature. Uh, she was born, I think, at 33 weeks. Anyone know when like uh, babies considered fully cooked? Yeah, 37, 38 when they're they're born, that should be uh, you know, considered full gestation. Um, she was like 33 weeks, so she was still considered early. And then she got pregnant a second time with twins. I feel really bad for my sister, but uh, she got all the kids out and just two goes, which is Good for her. Um, but actually, this is something they were concerned about early 
uh, early uh, labor for her. So this actually actually put her on uh, this progesterone uh, therapy. So there's a product called 17 alpha hydroxy progesterone. We'll talk about progesterones later on, especially when we get into like the oral contraception uh, section. Um, but this was a, an IM drug they would actually give weekly from week 16 to 36 to try to hold off on that pregnancy. Once they get to 36, they're probably far off, you know, uh, well-developed enough that we're going to have relatively few issues once they're born. Um, so that's when they would, uh, this is kind of the, the critical period. We're going to try to have a kid um, stay in there, stay, keep developing. Um, and really kind of the earliest time frame uh, neonate will survive after being born, like how the early gestation. Yeah, 24 is like kind of like that. that's really pushing it when it, as far as having a viable birth. So like we'll see like some 24 weekers, but they come out and they're like, you know, really just peanut size. I mean, they're like kind of like a grain, not actual peanut size. We call them peanuts when they're that small, but um, you know, less than less than a kilogram uh, size. Like they get really really tiny and they really have a lot of issues as as they develop. Because um, again, they should have been a mom for a whole lot longer. So um, this is why they uh, to give these progesterones, they tend to stave off labor uh, for a little bit longer. And typically, give high risk women have a history of preterm birth. So like my sister fell in that category, so she received this. Uh, and I believe her twins were actually born at 33 weeks to the day as well. So they are, uh, you know, who knows it would have been earlier without this therapy. Um, but I think as we get more evidence for its use, uh, it's becoming more and more um, common to use it for these uh, high risk women. And it used to have to be a specialty kind of pharmacy compounded product, uh, but now we actually have this hydroxyprogesterone uh, commercially available product, but it tends to be a lot more expensive than what you could get otherwise. But. Yeah, 10 minutes. Um, let's say you want to do the flip side. Let's say you want to get this this party started. Let's get this labor induced. Let's go. Um, you can actually use some medications to help kind of uh, speed this process along. So these are meant to help um, induce cervical ripening uh, and, and induce this labor. So we can actually give prostaglandins. I mentioned prostaglandins are good for keeping the PDA open, but prostaglandins also will help to uh, kind of develop the cervix a little bit more, get it uh, nice and ripened and ready to go uh, for that baby to come through. And so, uh, which is kind of interesting as well, because uh, prostaglandins are actually uh, uh, contraindicated. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the GI section, uh, but prostaglandins given to the mom earlier in pregnancy is actually an abortifacient, like can actually induce uh, labor way too early and actually cause an abortion. So we actually will hold off on those, not give them during the pregnancy, but once the patient's ready to give birth, uh, now we can go ahead and use these. So uh, dinoprostone or cervidil is one that's actually given vaginally, uh, placed right against the cervix and against a prostaglandin E2 analog. Uh, and then you would remove it, the product, once uh, labor begins or after 12 hours or so. If it hasn't really worked after 12 hours, it's probably not going to be that effective. Uh, and again, there's some issues where you can actually see some changes in fetal heart rate, so you do want to monitor for that, which you should be monitoring anyway during uh, the, the labor process. Uh, another one's called mesoprostol. This is just a prostaglandin E1 analog. It's not important to know which prostaglandins are analogs of, just know that they just identify them as a prostaglandin used to induce labor. Um, you also see mes uh, mesoprostol being used uh, commonly with some NSAIDs for prevention of uh, gastric ulcers. You guys know what prostaglandins do in the stomach? Hmm? Yeah, they help create that, that protective lining that neutralizes all those, those uh, gastric acids. And we mentioned NSAIDs do what to prostaglandins? They inhibit production. So that's why you get these gastric ulcers that form from NSAID use because you don't have that prostaglandin around. So if you give an NSAID plus this um, soprostol, that actually helps to maintain that barrier and prevent a gastric ulcer. So that's one indication for it. The other thing you can use it for would be uh, to induce labor for these patients. So I mean, one thing you'll actually see there. <laughs> It's kind of interesting. Uh, when I uh, first interned, it was at St. Vincent's Hospital up in Jacksonville, which is a, uh, a Catholic institution, and they actually did not carry misoprostol at all because of their uh, of the risk of someone you know taking it inappropriately and using it as a an abortive agent. Um, so they actually didn't carry it at all. I think they had Cervidil because that was you know more primarily just used locally uh, to help ripen the cervix. Um, but misoprostol is just like an oral tablet you could take, almost like an emergency contraception sort of. So we'll talk more about later. Uh, but you know, little little um, uh, interesting things with working different organizations with different uh, religious uh, backgrounds. Let's see. Um, Another thing we can use uh, is called oxytocin or pitocin. Uh, this is going to be one of the most commonly used agents. See a lot of pregnant women getting put on oxytocin uh, in order to help stimulate uh, uterine contractions and stimulate that cervical ripening. Um, this is very similar to the oxytocin that the woman is producing herself. Anyone know what else oxytocin does? Yeah, helps with helps with breast milk let down, things like that. Also, it's kind of like the the lovey dovey hormones. What helps link the mom and the baby together, and they love each other forever, and blah blah blah. Um, 
but uh, you know, it's it's a very important hormone. Uh, it's expressed in higher concentrations around uh, the the time of labor. But we can give uh, an extra push. We can give this exogenously um, uh, through the IV to help kind of stimulate things that go along. Um, these receptors are also upregulated, so they should work better at the time of labor, which is kind of a nice thing, and it will facilitate those contractions there. Now, there's some risk uh, to giving this. You can see things like arrhythmia, including PVC. So again, you're monitoring the mom's uh, heart rhythm, monitoring the baby as well. Uh, and there is some risk for, for bleeding due to this afibrogenemia uh, that can occur, uh, which is rare, but uh, is one thing to consider. So you're, again, looking for bleeding. Another complication of, uh, you know, after having a vaginal delivery is Mom's going to be bleeding anyway, so again, it's one of those things we monitor for and just look for uh, any any big changes happening there. If they're passing any like big clots or things like that, you want to watch for that. Okay, um, so labor pain management. We'll talk probably more about this in the ortho section later. How do we normally manage pain during a labor? Well, I mean, how do we not how do we monitor the pain? How do we treat the pain? Epidural. Yeah, so we're usually using an epidural. What's the benefit of using an epidural? Staying right there in the spinal column, you have very lim limited systemic exposure to the fetus. Because again, we're using pretty heavy duty drugs. We're using uh, usually a combination of fentanyl, which is a very strong opioid analgesic. Again, we'll talk about these later in the ortho section. Uh, and usually a local anesthetic. One uh, common one's called ropivacaine. It's also bupivacaine. It's very similar in, in function to lidocaine. I kind of mentioned that drug before, right? Um, so they're very good at, uh, and the other thing with applying uh, epidural is you can kind of set how far up that anesthesia you want to be is. So again, usually with having the patient kind of sitting up um, it should be setting kind of the lower part of the spinal column it should just be hitting kind of the lower extremities so kind of like you know the kind of the waist down where a lot of the pain's occurring um, and you can dial it back you're giving the continuous infusion so you can say okay well the patient's too numb I don't need them to feel something so they can push uh, when, when uh, time comes uh, so you can dial it back or if they're having too much pain you can dial it up and you know, all of that um, so we'll talk about that later but that's usually going to be a common uh, set of drugs we're going to give in order to help manage the pain uh, for that patient now, some issues you can have, you can have hypotension, uh, some pruritus, inability to avoid, because you might imagine you're affecting kind of the whole lower, lower half of the body there. Um, and because some uh, times they get dosed a little too heavily, uh, they don't really feel as much of that, that pressure to push, um, you can have prolongation kind of the first and second stages of labor. So uh, it can kind of slow things down a little bit. Uh, it's kind of interesting because when my wife had our first baby, um, the whole process from you know, showing up at the hospital to baby being born is about 16 hours. Way too long for my my, uh, my taste, and also for my wife's taste. That's obviously more important. Um, but she had the epidural, and so she was pretty well numb. And so, you know, the, it's funny when the ob guy came in uh, towards the end of the process, she's like, oh, yeah, if you didn't have that epidural, you would have had this baby uh, probably like eight hours ago. Because uh, that pain is, uh, you, you want to get rid of that pain. You want to get this thing out, done. Um, so that can uh, potentially prolong labor. So I always think about that uh, in my head. And then you can also see things like spinal headaches because, again, you do have to um, uh, you know, enter through the, the spinal column. So you can see uh, puncture of that subarachnoid space, and that can lead to headache afterwards. That's something to, to be concerned about. Okay, so I think that's all the time I have. Any questions on any of that? I'll, I'll give you three extra minutes of reprieve. Um, <laughs> any questions? Nothing? Okay. Uh, work on that assignment. You have roughly two weeks to, to go, so I think that should be reasonable. If you have any questions, let me know, um, and I will see you guys Friday.